And with that, <laughs> well, I'd like to thank Matt and Zach and even Greg for inviting us over here this this um, uh, this whatever month it is. So um, <laughs> I'm Nick Stark. This is Matt White. We're going to be talking about PFSense tonight. Um, Matt's going to kind of go over like what it does, what it's for, how you can use it, why you should use it. And I'm going to give um, a little demonstration of like how you configure a basic instance of PFSense. And we're going to do it all on Windows 3.1. So that should be fun, right? <laughs> no, that, that's a joke. We're not actually going to do that. <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Matt, and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, oh yeah, you should pull that over there. Present. Which one? Yeah. Well, I'm going to present in fail mode here. <laughs> yeah. So again, Matt, Nick. Uh, so what is PFSense? It's an open source firewall uh, software suite. Uh, that is the GitHub link that you'd like to roll your own. <laughs> Otherwise, you can actually install the ISO and install it that way. Um, what can PFSense be used for? Uh, a lot of folks don't know that it actually can be used as a DSL modem. Um, your WAN LAN router, DHCP, DNS, IPS, IDS, VPN, content filtering, the, it run, runs the whole, whole gamut of what you can do with it. And then, you know, well, well, what DSL, DSL modem, well, why, why do that? Uh, consumer modems, as you know, have Vulnerabilities. Nick can attest <laughs> to, to that. Um, <clears throat> and vendors just plain refuse to fix those. So, uh, botsnet, botnets, so Mirai, Reaper, all, all those botnets, BrickerBot, all those various bots that can actually access these things. And because it's fun, nation states. As you saw, like the news, what the VPN or. What, at the feds had you restart your equipment because of, of Russia, right? So that's really, and then here's a practical example of, of ARIS, which is an AT&T um, DSL modem. So backdoor number one, hard-coded creds, that, that affected about 15,000 of those models. Backdoor two was, uh, the magical port 49, uh, 49955 that keeps on giving. Uh, you have injection and default creds, sub tech and notepad. Um, <laughs> and Shodan's your best friend because you can go looking for all these devices using Shodan. Um, again, more hard coded creds on 61001. And there's a firewall bypass via port 49152, and you can all get it at this source link here down below. So if I haven't got you, yeah, again, you showed in. And if I, <coughs> here, here we have report 49152, 2,695,647. So. And I'm, that's just the one showed in its index, right? Yeah. And there's others other than that out there. Correct. So. Are they still selling that one? I haven't, I didn't go into checking that, but I know that they've, they've, put out a patch and well actually no in the notes they said they refused to patch it at the time that article was written that, that I referenced down here they, they are certainly still in circulation by your do they have yeah. the ability to push patches or is it something that the team so with with the uh, DSL gear uh, the Carrier typically provides it, so like MediaCom will auto auto update if you're in push your equipment. Using their equipment. If you're yeah. using their equipment, yeah. Yeah. if you're like me and you buy your own, and I got to go on and do it myself. Yeah. So again, tinfoil hat. Again, got any of that technical information? You're sounding like a vendor. You're pitching PFSense. <laughs> 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 um, so. 
First thing you'll want to do is you'll want to make sure you spec your throughput correctly. Uh, depending if you're if you have CenturyLink gigabit fiber to the home, if you're fortunate enough, you'll want at least uh, 3.5 gigahertz quad core uh, dedicated. You can buy the equipment off their website, or you can roll your own. And so, if you're rolling your own, you're going to want to make sure that uh, you have this Draytech card. They're the only vendor that I saw out there that actually sold the uh, PCIe cards that are the VDSL, APSL 2 plus card, um, as well as, uh, and then what do you want on the other side? You're going to have to terminate it to something, whether it's fiber channel, ethernet, uh, whatever. And then if you have fiber to the home, you're, you're fortunate enough that your GPON um, on the side of your house is going to actually talk Ethernet, so you can just terminate that into a gigabit uh, NIC or 10 gig if you want to future proof your stuff. Or, um, I'm looked into fiber channel, but that's not mm -hmm. quite here yet. With the PCI, are we looking at 8 by or 16 by? Or, that, that's kind of complicated, yeah. What's that now? For the PCI bus? Yeah. 8 by or 16 by? I'm running 16. Okay. I, yeah, I've seen a little depend on what you're looking for, too. But. I didn't, I didn't get those specifications, but I personally rock 16, so. Um, and so let's get into how to configure it. You're going to go um, specifically click on interfaces, WAN. You're going to change the IP port configuration type to PPOE, and then that will open up the PPOE configuration. You'll just dump in your creds there that, for your carrier. Um, as well as you'll want to, if you have CenturyLink fiber to the home, you'll want to remember to VLAN tag because from your NIC to the uh, the GPON, it's tagged. Uh, default is 201 is the VLAN that everybody's uh, living in. So you'll go to interface assignment and then go ahead and pick the interface that you want and tag it at 201, hit save, and it's that easy to set up your your equipment. Uh, potential gotchas, if you're running in a virtual environment, uh, what you'll find is you'll want to make your port static, otherwise every time you power cycle your equipment or power outage or something, your ports are going to flip-flop, so your ESXi host will go up, PFSense will boot up, but then all of a sudden your ports are flopped around until, unless you make your uh, ports static. Um, and don't double VLAN tag as well. So again, it's either VLAN tag in your hypervisor or VLAN tag in PFSense. And again, if you want super hard mode, go ahead and roll your own uh, from source. And from there, I'll give it to Nick to perform the demo. Thanks, Matt. So let me... Um, I, for this presentation, I built a little lab out, and uh, I'd like to go over the network topology of the lab before I like start just flowing flowing through the uh, the web UI showing you stuff. So I, the reason why we were delayed on this presentation is because like I did this all virtualized on this computer, and um, apparently you have to boot all of the network machines before you boot the PFSense instance for VirtualBox to wire everything up properly, and that's why we were a little bit delayed. So I've got four virtual machines running. Um, the, one of them is the PFSense router, which what represents the WAN and then all, all the WAN interfaces. So there's, uh, there's four NICs on this uh, VM, which would correspond to like a, a, um, you know, a, a router with you know, multiple NICs on it. So there's, you can just imagine a router sitting right here with, with four NICs in it. One of them is going to be a WAN. One of them's going to be a LAN, one of them's going to be an OPT1, and one of them's going to be an OPT2. So those each correspond to a different NIC, a virtual NIC in this instance. Um, each one of those networks has one VM running on it, and there are some firewall rules configured so that they can't speak across um, some of these networks. Uh, I know you can do that with VLANs, but um, you can isolate networks too. Uh, so before I jump right into this, I want to say something. I don't 
do blue team stuff very much, so I'm probably going to be missing stuff. If I miss something that's like really important, please just shout it out because I want everyone to learn. You know, here I don't, and I mean, my, me too. I want to learn how to do this stuff better because um, I don't do it very well. I, I, all this experience is based on you know a couple years of just running it at home. I'm gonna close the slides. Type in the super secure password. Okay. So this is what you are presented with when you log in to the web interface of the PFSense instance. Um, notice that this is not available on the WAN by default. PFSense has pretty good default settings, and this is only gonna be available on the WAN. Um, in fact, you have to create special firewall rules to let it be accessible anywhere else other than the WAN. So um, this machine, this, this Ubuntu is more, ignore the host name, but um, this one's running on WAN, and um, you just type in the IP address of the network head, and you, are, you log in, and you have this nice, nicely done interface. This interface has come a long way in a couple of years. Uh, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do is make sure all your NICs are up. And in this case, since it's a virtualized instance, like you don't have to worry about wires being unplugged. It's just all connected by the hypervisor. So we can see here all of our interfaces that they all got uh, gigabit links on them and they're all up. Hey Nick, so, are you up? Am I up? I'm checking my Nick's up. So uh, after that, I generally like to configure my interfaces. Uh, assignments. So I had to go through here and assign each one of these originally, and it's just part of the setup process. You, you specify which of these virtual NICs corresponds to which network you want to spin up and put stuff on. Uh, you can also configure things like interface groups and VLANs here. I didn't do that for this because I'm running everything on separate networks and really with like four VMs running, I can't run too many more without my machine just dying. So uh, this is also where you set up like uh, PPOE. So like if we go into here and go into like WAN, uh, you, you know, this is the WAN interface and this is where you would consider PPOE if you were doing it the DSL setup like Matt was talking about. Um, right here it's configured to receive a IP address by DHCP, which is normally what you're going to want to have on your WAN, uh, so you can fetch an IP address from your ISP's DNS server. Let's see what other options we have in here. Uh, client configuration, you can set all these options and do all these things with all this stuff, and it's really nice and handy, and there's lots of options that you can configure. Uh, two of the things that are really important are these things, uh, these block private networks and block bygone networks. So like, Private networks are IP addresses, you know, like the 10 dot range, or 10 dot range, the 172.16 range, and the 192.168 range. All those fun networks that you use locally. Block traffic from those on the WAN, that, that's kind of a firewall rule. And then the bog on log, uh, block bog on networks is like IP addresses that haven't been allocated yet. You don't want to be receiving like spoofed messages from IPs that haven't been allocated by um, uh, was it I A N A? Aaron. Yeah, uh, Aaron, Aaron, or AP Nick, or whatever. Yeah. So. If you're virtualizing your, your WAN, make sure you don't check that first checkbox check, otherwise you'll have lane traffic. Really? Oh yeah, that's right. Your Nick will come up. Yeah, if it's if it's laying on a internal network, that's one change you have to make if you are going to do like interface change or stuff. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's great. I didn't know that. Thank you, Cody. Uh, take a look at the WAN interface, just because it's a little bit different. Similarly, if you're building a, a physical box inside your own or virtual wall. wall. Typically virtual, but. Yeah, that, no, that's what I'm saying. If you're doing like a physical, for like an internal bastion host, oh, yeah. same thing. Because yeah. you're going to want your internal, your WAN is still going to be on your internal WAN that same thing. Oh, yeah, like if you have it on the head. So I've got like an XP box in front of a printer, right? Like an industrial printer, and I want to get a firewall in front of it. If I'm doing PFSense on that, that the WAN on that ESS box in front of that XP box is going to be on my internal master. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? 
the concept of firewalling things outside the perimeter, right? <laughs> Good stuff. What is this movie? <laughs> uh, so I have um, the, the land nick configured to this 192.168.58.1 uh, address. And then, uh, of course, if I want anything on that network can, attached to that nick, having um, an IP address without statically assigning it on the host, I have to have a DHCP server, right? Something to issue IP addresses to other hosts on the network. So that's the next thing I want to show you is uh, where you configure DHCP. And I believe that's under services, DHCP server. And uh, yeah, it starts you on the LAN. You uh, select if you want to enable it. You can also optionally ignore boot key queries if you're running boot key equipment, like you may need that option turned on, but otherwise I would turn it off because uh, it's old and only weird things run on it anyway. <laughs> uh, you can set the range of IP addresses, real easy, real straightforward, just the start to the end. Uh, I like to give myself 100 IP addresses because um, that's how old I hope I live to be. <laughs> and do you live on boot key then? No, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that sort of thing. That's not, that's not my, my spiel. Oh, yeah. One of the other things that you're going to want to set up after you set up your DHCP server and your interfaces is like uh, DNS. Yeah. So if you come in here and go to general setup, you're going to be presented with some nice options like what do you want your host name to be for this device? Uh, I left it with PFSense just because I didn't change it, but you can also set like the domain here if you're running it on a domain. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I run, at home, I run everything on my domain, and like I have all these options filled out, and it works really, it just works seamlessly, especially if you have like a VPN configured, you can just connect to your VPN and hit other host names on your, on your uh, network based off of like the domain. It's just really seamless. Uh, I set the DNS server to uh, the privacy one, which was, uh, what was it, uh, Cloudflare. Yeah, so this is the brand new one that's really fast and really private and no one can steal your traffic or see your traffic, right? Right, I mean, no one no one looks at past the DNS. Yeah, so, uh, let's see here. You can add, add additional DNS servers. One of the most important options I recommend to people when they're setting up PS instances Disable this. Uh, do not let your ISP give you their crappy DNS server IP address to uh, to use for DNS because you, yeah, they'll sell your information. They'll do all kinds of stuff. It'll be nasty if you're trying to do a wild card. If you're trying to hit a domain that doesn't exist, like they'll send you to a really ugly page that tries to like sell you stuff, and you know it's just it's just nasty. If you can avoid it, I, I highly recommend avoiding using your ISP's DNS servers. Sometimes it's not, it's not it's unavoidable, but um, if you can avoid it, you should, probably should. I'm sorry, what, what's the option? Uh, the DNS server to use as the, the, the ISP DNS. Yeah, so um, I recommend that. Like, I mean, it's not going to cause you any problems, but like this. Uh, what, what other options? Are there? Like Cloudflare or Cisco's um, Open DNS, Google's 8.8.8.8.8.4.4. If you want to give Google even more information about yourself, but he's referring to that DNS server override right there at the bottom. Oh, of the screen. is that what you meant? He's no, saying uncheck that. Not, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. So okay. just as a an aside, uh, so the now Cisco Open DNS uh, 208.67.222.222, .222 and then 2.220, it does some general blanket um, filtering. So if you hit uh, sites that are no malware, it'll block that for you. Uh, they have the paid service that does, you know, even better stuff. But well, there's, a, there's the free family version that you can do content filtering for your kids and stuff. Yeah. 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 One problem with them is that they don't update their GUID. So when uh, somebody buys a new block and starts hosting websites in Des Moines and a block that was then previously hosted in Eastern Europe somewhere, uh, Cisco decides to block it everywhere. So just keep that in mind. They're they're kind of slow on their GUID. So that reminds me of an interesting feature that PFSense has. Like at home, uh, I used to run a VPN server off my PFSense box. And um, 
Oh my gosh, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Um, run a, uh, a VPN server off my PSNS box. I have that box hooked up to a public I, like address, DNS address. So my IP address changes like every 12 hours because my ISP is cool like that. So I have to have a way of updating my, DN, my, my DNS record for my domain um, with Route 53 who hosts my DNS server stuff. So uh, PSN has got an awesome feature where you can like give it a pair of IAM credentials and it'll just like automatically send update your DNS with Route 53 um, whenever uh, your, uh, your WAN address changes. It's really useful. I've been running it for like three or four years now and never had one, one problem with anyone connecting to my VPN and it's just worked perfectly. Um, so that's a really cool feature. I, let me see if I can figure out where that is. In my firewall. Services. Services. Yeah, this is it. Um, let's see if we can find the AWS option. Yeah, service size AWS is going to be in here if I can move my mouse. Am I, am I looking at the wrong place, Cody? No, it might be under Route 53, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good call. Uh, and obviously, you can do this with a bunch of different services, right? This, this is not the only, Route 53 is not the only one you can do it with. You can do it with, like, no IP and you have a super shady host name somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> like, you host your C2 server off of it and have fun with that. Um, so while we're talking about it, let's look at the firewall configuration. I'll show you some of the rules I created. So the WAN obviously has like everything, no talky talky. You know, it doesn't like want you to be able to send any traffic to it unless you specifically say, hey, I want port 80 open to host the web server to everyone. WAN is the exact opposite. It has everything open to everywhere and this anti-lockout rule, which um, keeps you from locking yourself out of a web interface. Highly recommend not deleting that because you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to like re, if you want to make a change, you're gonna have to reinstall your operating system, your whole PF system, system rebuilds everything, and it's gonna suck for you. Uh, here are my other two networks I created. Uh, this one says you cannot talk to LAN, you cannot talk to OP2, but other than that, have a party. Uh, the OP2 one is the exact opposite. And it says uh, you can't talk to off one or WAN, everything else, have a party. So um, OP1 and OP2 are just not supposed to talk anywhere else on the local network other than you know, themselves, other things on their local segment. So how does it know which rule to use first? Uh, it's in order. So like the top one gets applied first, the bottom one gets applied second. And if I want to move rules, I can click and drag it and reorder it and save it. Uh, and then you have to click another button for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now the rules are applied and um, it's reloaded <coughs> and your firewall is set to go. Uh, so, any questions on firewall rules? Anything you want to see specifically that you think is cool? Okay, cool. We'll move on. We'll look at VPN next. I didn't, I didn't configure VPN because there's really no point in a virtualized instance of setting up a VPN on something that's netted behind this desktop anyway. Uh, you got three options, IPsec, L2TP, OpenVPN. You can, you know, it, it's really, really simple to set up VPNs with um, PFSense. Uh, if, if you haven't, I think IPsec's probably the most difficult and there's like great tutorials on the NetGate documentation as well as um, other tutorials on the internet that show you exactly how to set up so that you can connect to it from like your phone, you know, or whatever, like your iPhone or your Android, because those have IPsec built in and not OpenVPN by default. So OpenVPN is even easier. There's like a wizard. You just click a couple buttons and then fire up some start email to yourself, right? Or like, you know, put on a web server and just pull over HTTP. It's good, right? For your, like your certs or a whole bundle. You yeah. Can and I just put them on PageSpan. Put all my shit on PageSpan. It's just great. It works well, well. Then you can do it anywhere. It's like yeah, exactly. It's like the cloud, except for you know you don't have to worry about anyone stealing your stuff, right? Yeah, you know, we have to for either. Yeah. <laughs> Bonus all around. 
so this, like like any nice high end piece of equipment, it's going to um, have captive portal. Uh, you can see the GHCP leases. We can look, take a look at those real quick. Um, those are the other machines on my network. I accidentally named one administrator for some reason. <laughs> I didn't realize that until just now. Let's see here. Yeah, and then your interface, you can like renew your um, your WAN IP address if you want to. You can you know, relinquish the DHCP lease and get a new IP address if you're so inclined. You can control all your other interfaces too from here, I think. Gives you some nice information on how much traffic has gone over the network. Uh, what else is on status? Oh yeah, your NTP, like, you can have you can have the NTP service running, and I actually recommend you do, um, so that all your network traffic is coordinated with one thing that coordinates with the one thing in the internet. Uh, so NTP stats give you some information on the NTP servers uh, that you're using upstream, uh, and the last thing we'll kind of go over is like diagnostics. Uh, this is where like your backup and restore option is. You can back up the entire configuration of your PFSense instance. You can encrypt that so that it's encrypted from um, download to upload on your new instance. I've used this a lot. It works great. It's really easy to switch hardware with this. So for instance, I just bought a NetGate SG-1000 red little ARM-based PFSense instance. And I was able to take my old, clunky, nasty, five nick, very slow uh, firewall and, and just download the config and re-upload it to the new box and it just, everything worked perfectly. Um, it was like I had completely cloned everything and just moved it over devices, it's great. Uh, there's DNS lookup, there's this awesome feature where you can execute operating system commands uh, this is very, very dangerous in my opinion. If I found this on a device doing a device assessment, I would write it as a finding. But uh, if you need to operate, if you need to execute shell commands, you can do that here. Uh, alternatively, you can enable SSH and do it that way. Can you show us cross-site with the like forgery? Um, no, because they fixed all that, right? So like they had this huge problem two or three years ago with <coughs> cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. And there was actually exploits written out there that were really easy to use, where if you could convince someone to visit a web page, you could like post to the PSS instance. It was authenticated. You could execute operating system commands um, and like do whatever you wanted. You know, at that point, you can open up ports on the WAN and do all kinds of fun stuff. But they fixed all that, and uh, version 2.4. Uh, .x is great, it has a better interface, it looks nicer, it works better, it has all the modern browser protections against cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery, um, and it's good, it really is, it's a good interface. I've, I found about 30 or 40 of the cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in this interface, so I've audited it heavily. It's a good interface. Uh, I want to point out one thing. PFSense <coughs> is run by NetGate, which is a manufacturing company that manufactures hardware that you install PFSense on. Uh, their hardware is generally high quality, also kind of expensive, uh, but it's American made, so if you have those kind of concerns, you know, you don't want to buy hardware made elsewhere, um, that's definitely an option I would recommend. Do they make that little arm? Base? Yes, the little, it's red, it's got two nicks in it, it looks like an Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's very sturdy. Only downside is it's not very fast. I have it hooked up and I'm getting about 100 megabits per second upstream through the WAN and about, I don't know, 125 on the LAN, just a little bit faster. It's got two, it's got two Ethernet circuits. No, yeah, it, when one's gonna be for your, like, connect your cable modem or your DSL modem or your... But that, that typical connection is, is Ethernet? Yes, correct. When you, when you get Ethernet from your cable modem, you are already using your ISPs. And that cable modem is using its DNS is in that box. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Um, I mean, how, do you, how does this, putting this after your cable modem so circumvent where it's already taken? The WAN 
on your POSIS instance is going to talk to your cable modem, and the MAC on the WAN is actually going to be what requests the IP address through your ISP ZNS uh, server. So oh, we'll do it that one time. Or, I, or DHCP yours, server. So yours will just get the HDMI. Uh, this will be the first hop. Yeah. Uh, so cable modems do have IP addresses. They're supposed to be private, internal, and only accessible to ISPs. A lot of times they're not, and that's a bad thing. Uh, I you come. <laughs> um, but th those are addresses are generally you're not ever supposed to have access to or see or, or do anything with. Um, so uh, usually though the public IP address is assigned to the MAC address on the WAN. And like then, if you call up, um, if, yeah, if you call up CenturyLink, you give them the MAC address on the cable modem, so they can get the the internal IP address of the cable modem, and then allow communication through that IP address to um, your public IP address. It's kind but of for, for you to abstract their DNS. If you're using, if you use their DNS to go to like cloud DNS, it would get, it would resolve to get you to cloud DNS, and then all your traffic. Would then be encapsulated to cloud DNS to go. Am I understanding that right? Uh, I mean, DNS is like the domain name right, system. Right. right. How do you? How do you? I'm trying to decide how we bypass the DNS that comes part and parcel with their cable modem. So the D, the DNS servers that the ISP wants you to use are issued to you in the DHCP response. So in that response, there's going to be some binary data that says. Hey, set your IP, set your DNS upstream to this address, and um, you can click that box I was showing you earlier. Or you just don't. Yeah. And you use your own. IP. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, does that make sense? Am I explaining it okay? I get it. Okay. Cool. Uh, I don't have much else. Is there anything anyone else wants to see or talk about? Did you go to the dashboard page? Yeah. Oh yeah, I should forgot all about the dashboard. <laughs> Where's that at again? I think you just diagnostic. Like I haven't looked at this. No, oh, okay, we'll go here. Okay. Oh, yeah, this stuff? Yeah. And yeah. You can actually add a widget. Yeah, it's a widget. Yeah. Where's that at? Yeah, add at the top. Oh, yeah. I never mess with this. This one? No, it's the X button. The right thing. Yeah, okay. You can tell I'm a noob. <laughs> so there's, there's stuff like your, your traffic monitoring, firewall logs. Traffic graphs, these are fun. Smart status. Yeah, which I don't get. What is that? Hard drive status of your router? Or what is it? Well, because the DSM Plus has a hard drive, right? Yeah, I mean, but I don't know why you want to monitor it. I, I, guess that's a, I guess that's a thing. You can do it if you wanted to. You're Zach and you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my read speed today. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, these are some nice, nice graphs that take up a lot of CPU resources to generate. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I don't have anything right on off one that's too exciting, but my wing is really having fun as it's sending graphs over the wire. Okay, <laughs> I'm done. Anyone else? Any other questions? Any other things you want to talk about? Did you also want to bring up other services like Snort or things that can be added to PSS? Uh, I, spoke, I forgot everything about this presentation. Yeah. So there's, <laughs> there's a whole package manager built into um, uh, PFSense. And like I was talking to Matt on the way over here. A lot of people just use like the Snort one, and that's like the only one I really used. So um, that's that's one I can recommend. I don't know about the rest. I've heard of people using the GOIP blocking. Yeah. To block traffic from outside the United States, Cody's shaking his head. Does it not work? I, I don't believe in I don't believe in the GOI well, filtering because it causes more. I, in my case, in my scenario, it always causes more problems than it solves. Yeah. Well, that's because yeah. you're on those Russian websites all the yeah. time, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. For some reason, my IP in Florida is listed in New York, yeah. or you know the same thing that happened to the one on four block where it gets listed in Eastern Europe. And do you just yeah. gotta stop using Tor? <laughs> my wife's QuickBooks tried to update all the time. I can't update because I'm on top set happy from Europe. AT and T trucking software that keeps track of trucks is hitting China. It's not in China. Yeah. There's great trucks to it. It's in Texas, but you know, like, the databases are really poor. In my opinion. Yeah, and the database this uses is free. So that that <laughs> you get what you pay for. <laughs> you want if you want a good database, you can pay 
before, but I don't know how you'd integrate it with this, so that's just a thing. Um, but yeah, there's a whole package manager here. We can take a look at it. I don't even remember where it is. Is it some package manager or something? Package manager, yay! Yeah, so available packages, you can type in and snort. So what's, nice, what's nice complimentary with Snort is Watchdog. So in case your Snort service goes down, it'll restart it for whatever services you have running. Another button that I have to press. Does someone have to install it once for me to install that? So I mean, it's literally that easy to set up Snort. You just click two buttons and it's installed. Of course, um, you have to configure it, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many ignorance for it on. Also, updates are free, and they, they're easy to install. If you go back to this main screen, it'll tell you if you're out of date. Unless you want the emerging threat rule set, then you have to pay money. Uh, they also offer a rule set that you don't have to pay money for, like a community rule set. Um, There's like five different rule yeah. sets that you get. Yeah, the Snort VRD, like uh, kind of their pseudo professional ones, are like 32 bucks a year, or 35 bucks a year. It's worth it. It's super cheap, yeah. Uh, the update thing is, where is it? It's over here somewhere. Where are we on? Right here. And it, yeah, it'll say right here, and you can like refresh this if you're impatient and just like sit here and keep refreshing. <laughs> okay, uh, for reals, I'm done. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, 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 yeah.